My name is Ron Richmond. I was interested in airplanes at the strong old age of four or five years old and used to build little paper airplanes when the Sunday Los Angeles Times came out and uh, they had a cutout and instead of it being a flat pattern it folded and used flour and water paste you know stuff that's easy available and uh, glued it together to make a three-dimensional airplane. So that was it at that young age and always interested in airplanes went into rubber band flying models and then gasoline powered flying models and uh, at the end of World War II, I see I was only 10 when World War II started, so I couldn't do any kind of aviation stuff at that age. So after it was, uh, it was over with, uh, it turns out that there weren't any jobs in, in the aerospace industry because they spent it all winning in World War II. And my uh, advisors suggested that I should uh, um, take petroleum engineering because petroleum was on the upcoming and, and I got a job at Richfield Oil in Bakersfield and it was a, a part-time job uh, mostly on the weekends and, and after I, I think I worked there for three years and I was because of my advisors at Bakersfield College which is a two-year junior college all recommended that I have petroleum engineering. Uh, my boss's boss's boss, uh, Joe Shea at Richfield, called me into his office one weekend and said, uh, Ron, what, what do you really want to do in your life? And I said, well, I've always wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and not a petroleum engineer. And Joe Shea said, Ron, you go back and you tell the advisors at Bakersfield College to change you to mechanical engineering with an aero option and forget the petroleum, which I did. So I applied to UCLA and to Caltech, and I was accepted at both for graduate school, and Caltech had a better reputation than UCLA in aeronautics, so I selected Caltech. And as, as we went along, I had uh, a job at uh, Lockheed, uh, Burbank part-time and uh, full-time in the summer uh, for about three years and uh, I was in the aerodynamics department and was second to the leader of the performance subgroup within aerodynamics and I was in charge of, of uh, new issues, new airplanes, whereas uh, they did a lot of calculations on existing airplanes, but I was uh, there person that goes to the advanced development department where new airplanes are being developed. And anyway, that, that was fine, it was fun, but after two years, Donald Douglas decided to regroup all of his outlying engineering groups like Long Beach to Santa Monica. And I had a new house in Anaheim <laughs> and there weren't any freeways back then. So I quit Douglas after two years and went to work at Ford Aerospace in Newport Beach. And it was uh, mainly missile oriented instead of aircraft oriented. So I had to transfer my loyalties from airplanes to missiles. I would say that the big break was when Joe Shea at Richfield Oil in Bakersfield told me to go back and change my curriculum to mechanical engineering with an aero option instead of petroleum engineering. That was really, really helpful. Up to that time, in high school and in early junior college, I had not even had a physics course because my um, specialties from the high school advisors was math and drawing. And I was very good at drawing, mechanical drawings, and uh, pretty good at math, but I didn't even know what physics was. So in, in uh, the middle of junior college, after Joe Shea, I started taking physics courses and they were marvelous. Mechanics was the best one and then uh, electronics uh, was more complicated and uh, light and so forth uh, was interesting, but mechanics was the one that I was most interested in. 
There was another part of Ford Aerospace that was satellites up in Palo Alto. And from Newport Beach, uh, we actually designed the fueling uh, carts and so forth for the satellites that were built by uh, Ford Aerospace up in, in Palo Alto. So anyway, th uh, that company that bought the two parts of the Ford Aerospace, um, the one it called Aeronutronic, that was the one at Newport Beach, uh, they didn't care about the missiles and, and they sold that and they sold it to Martin Aircraft which later was acquired by Lockheed and became Lockheed Martin. Anyway, that was the part that I was mostly involved with. But after the 27 years, I was old enough to take an early retirement. And so what I did is go to UCI and start teaching aeronautical design to the senior mechanical engineers. And of course, I was mostly interested in the overall performance of an aircraft and uh, not just the details of the design. So I taught my students, you know, how to, how to determine the performance of big airplanes, like a 747, going from LA to uh, London or, or Berlin, uh, wherever, and to do the calculations that would indicate that it carried a certain number of people and it would make it there and have enough um, fuel left to do uh, alternate airports in case there was a problem with the airport, airplane. And uh, so the, the students, I only had 16 students as an elective the first year at uh, UCI. And uh, the second year, they must have really liked it because I had 32 students. <laughs> I also t uh, taught some individual uh, classes besides the aeronautics but I left them with a complete set of, of uh, requirements to create a school of aeronautics and mechanical engineering at UCI, and they did that after I left. I went to work for another company called Brunswick Defense, and Brunswick Defense uh, had a few people, uh, mainly the one that was the vice president general manager, was from Ford Aerospace, and so he, he loved lobbed onto me uh, right off and uh, I was in charge of programs, new programs at Brunswick and uh, later I was in charge of engineering at Brunswick. So I, I think I was there six or seven years before f retiring again. At Brunswick we had uh, one or two airplane type products but uh, everything else was missile oriented which I was uh, skilled at from Ford Aerospace. And uh, one interesting thing, we, we built a glider uh, which was mounted on the A3 aircraft from Navy ships. And you could carry as many as 22 of these heavy gliders on an A3, but they typically would only carry six, three on the left and three on the right. And these were about 10 feet long each 18 inches square with rounded corners and it had a Lunaberg lens in the nose and a low frequency antenna mounted in the retractable wings and they would drop these uh, gliders off of the A3 aircraft from the uh, carrier and they would separate out and, and have six items plus the original aircraft all coming in at the Iranian uh, ground targets. And the Iranian had expensive radar missiles at their ground control. And after two nights, Saddam Hussein said he had shot down 68 of the friendlies in that war where, where Iran invaded Kuwait. Only two of the 68 were friendly aircraft, maybe ours but the other 66 were Brunswick decoys. Those guys were shooting down the Brunswick decoy and our decoy would go in towards the radar ground sites of the Iranians and a separate aircraft with an expensive radar seeking missile uh, would come in and launch it at the ground site and kill the ground site. So after two nights, the Iranians on the ground with their expensive radar uh, ground-to-air missiles would not launch any more aircraft. 
And we had complete control of the skies after two nights in the Iranian-Kuwait battle. My personal achievements, uh, of course, the model airplanes, I flew those. And uh, a lot of the flights were, were just north of the Meadows Field, the main airport in Bakersfield because my, my father had moved us to Bakersfield when I was either four or five, because in the depression, he couldn't get work. And he would get work one day a week, and uh, that bought the gasoline to hunt <laughs> for work for the other four days. And so after, I don't know, a couple of years of, of doing that, he found a job in Bakersfield for 40 hours a week. And he moved us all to Bakersfield. When I was 13, I took some of my lawn mowing money and went out to Meadows Field after World War II and took a ride in a Taylor Craft tandem Taylor Craft. Most of the Taylor Crafts were side by side, but this was a tandem. And I was just enamored with airplane ride. I mean, I, you couldn't believe it. It was so much better than the model airplanes. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so I liked that, and so when I got to be 15, uh, I started going to the airport on my bicycle, and I worked on Luscombe airplanes for Sierra Airways in exchange for lessons. My rate of pay was 75 cents an hour, and an, an hour of dual in the Luscombe was $10.50 an hour. So I, I worked a lot of hours to get my, my hour of lesson, but anyway, so when I got to be uh, 16, that was the minimum age to solo. And I got a permit to solo, and I was only 16 in one or two days. But the FAA made sure that I was 16 before, before they sent my certificate that said I could solo. So at age 17, which was the minimum age for a private, I took the test a week before I was 17. And the inspector said, come back in a week, kid, and I'll give you your license. So he did, and, and I had that. When finally I was in my second year of graduate school, my brother and I and a fellow named George Ed Salabaher, who was my roommate up at Berkeley for a couple of years, but now I'm in graduate school at Caltech, went to a dance up in the mountains, and I met this lovely girl named Mary Louise Gates. And she, she, my, my friend said, oh, she's married uh, already. And so I danced with her and I said, you, my buddies tell me you're married. And she says, I'm not married. So I, I met Mary and I heard her talking to some other guys at the dance up in the mountains that she lived so far out of town, she didn't have a phone. Well, when I got home, I looked in the phone book and I knew her father's name. And there was a phone for that father's name out on Fairfax Road, very southeast end of Bakersfield. And so I called that phone number and I got a hold of her cousin. And finally she got on the phone and I said, what are you doing in bed? <laughs> so late on, on Sunday morning, since Saturday's dance had ended. Anyway, uh, I said, how would you like to go on a date? And she seemed amenable. I said, how would you like to go flying? So I took her for a ride in a Cessna 120 on our very first date. That's my Mary and, and she has been wonderful to me. Unfortunately, she got ill several years ago and she had uh, Parkinson's disease for many years, but then she fell three times and broke one hip twice and the other hip once and uh, she couldn't do a lot of things that she had been doing. So I was a 24 seven caregiver for four years before she finally passed away. So we were married for over 63 years and, and then she passed away. And I've been a widower ever since. Well, I, I hope that this, the people I have run cross paths with have learned enough from me to help them in their jobs and so forth. And uh, as an example, when I was in charge of the, the gun area at Ford Aerospace, uh, I had written a proposal for a 25 millimeter, very high performance cannon 
multi-barreled, which, which used caseless ammunition. In other words, the projectile was buried within a case of propellant, and that case was fed into a firing chamber and so forth. And two of my old-time gunners, uh, they came to me and said, you know, Dr. Richmond, guns do not obey Newton's laws. So they were used to designing by feel, you know, change this, change that, and see what happens. And, and I called them up short immediately when they said that. Anyway, I said, unless the gun has stuff inside of it that's moving at a significant fraction of the speed of light, the gun does obey Newton's laws, and you just don't know how to model it. They walked away and they never approached me again with a new statement like that. So, I mean, I, I was, you know, sort of teaching them basic physics as we went along. <laughs> If I had to summarize my life's work in one word, it would be aviation. And the talk I had prepared for the um, Experimental Aircraft Association was called A Lifetime of Aviation. And I have 71 pages of view graphs here to indicate my schooling, education, uh, flight experience, and all that. Uh, over the uh, in, in 71 pages of information. I would be like, like to be remembered as an honest, fair person. I, I do not uh, go with people who lie and cheat and that sort of thing. I've always been uh, true to, you might say mainly my mother, but both my mother and my father's teaching of uh, not to be a liar and, and to believe in the Ten Commandments in the Christian religion. And uh, that's what I've tried to shape my, my life. <laughs>